<laughs> is is an is an excellent text. And when you look at it, uh, I realized I was not going to be able to lecture on the content of that chapter, uh, but you can easily read it on your own. We just don't have the time. Uh, tonight, I wanted to put a tighter focus on this presentation. I wanted to kind of address topics that would be more personal to this audience. I wanted to cover a subject that would be immediately useful uh, for you as naturalists on their next outing into the field. I also wanted to identify some common ground in our ethics, that some things that we share and emphasize skills that we also share in our roles as naturalists and archeologists. Uh, when you get right down to it and you look at it, we are, I just, we are teammates <laughs> uh, in our pursuit of knowledge. Uh, actually, a naturalist and archeologist kind of need each other in order to better understand our field of interest or in our chosen disciplines. I'm always pleased to be in the company of uh, our, our naturalists. Um, I've worked as a naturalist at a nature center for a number of summers, and uh, I've always appreciated their skills. Uh, you guys, you love to learn, you love to explore. Your skills of observation place you, in my opinion, in a very special category. Uh, you see the small details in nature that most people would never notice. Um, as naturalists, you move through the world with a more highly developed awareness of what's around you. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to be encouraging you to add another area to your skills of observation. <laughs> um, your field experiences and knowledge as naturalists make you perfect participants for this evening's topic. I'm suggesting that you begin to include the genus of Homo into your nature observations. Uh, we, we look at all kinds of other forms of life. <laughs> okay, anyway, I want to make the point that humans are as much a part of nature as any other organism. We are also present in all of the Earth's environments and the study of natural history has included humans. Um, thinkers like John Muir, Edward Abbey, Thoreau, they saw humanity as part of nature and taught that we are absolutely dependent on nature's resources for our survival. It is nearly unbelievable to me that such an obvious fact is so easily and continually ignored. Now, I guess one of the things that I want to approach here this evening is the idea of ethics. Um, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not, you know, somebody that contemplates that a lot, but I do understand its importance. And it is a shared concern of naturalists and archaeologists. As naturalists, you're probably aware of our nation's early environmental condition. America's natural resources seem to be limitless. The continent abundantly provided the raw materials for a rapidly expanding population. The natural resources were there for the taking. They didn't seem to legally belong to anyone. The raw materials could be obtained with a little effort, but the value of those resources made the work worthwhile. No rules hindered gathering of those natural materials, so forests could be removed Grasslands could be grazed down to bare earth. Farmlands could be stripped of their soil and their fertility. And mines were turned loose to poison land and the water. There were no regulations really of any kind that hindered the destruction of the environment. Now, when the land's resources were exhausted, people just moved on and repeated the same process as they spread across the continent. Eventually, the consequences of that ignorance and that greed could no longer be ignored. Laws had to be established and enforced to conserve what was left of our natural resources and to protect our people. Now, you're probably sitting there wondering, why the history lesson? Uh, what's my point? The point is this. It seems to me that our nation has followed that same path in our attitude and behavior concerning cultural resources. The ancient remains did not seem to belong to anyone. 
The artifacts, just like the resources, could be easily obtained. The artifacts and the sites held monetary value. They were limitless. When one site was destroyed, there were millions more out there to find. So there were no rules, no regulations, no limits. Take whatever you wanted. Whenever the resource was exhausted, move to the next site, mine that resource, and then move again. And just as our natural resources were wasted and destroyed, so are the cultural resources of our state and nation. By show of hands, how many of you read something by Aldo Leopold? Oh, boy. Yeah. I kind of thought that'd be the case. <laughs> Leopold's considered the father of wildlife ecology. He was a very powerful influence in the development of environmental ethics and wilderness conversation. His work, uh, the Sand County Almanac, did we, did we get back there? Got it back to so, We've already been there. Keep going. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, anyway, it's probably his most read book. And he developed uh, the concept of a land ethic. That work was published in 1949. Um, it was also kind of the primary uh, text, I guess, for the first Earth Day. Anybody here attend that? Oh, fewer hands <laughs> went up on that one. <laughs> the first one. First one was in 1970. Anyway, there there is a code of ethics that should be observed concerning the environment. And before Leopold, our nation's predominant land ethic had been conquest and expediency and self-interest. And today, naturalists have a better code of ethics. And uh, you can see the, uh, did you go past the, uh, I guess you did. The, the, the uh, can you, can we back that up? Okay, can we back it up? I hope it doesn't blow up. It's, it's not backing up. Okay, can back. Can you back it up? Can you do that? Okay. Ah, there it is. There it is. Okay. No, it's no. not up there. It's not up. Okay, but what, what we just go down now. Yeah, just go down. I mean, there's Sand County. All right. There we are. No. Nope. Oh. No wonder I was confused. <laughs> I'm seeing it here, and it's not there. Ah, this has uh, been an eventful evening. All right, let's go on. Anyway, the, uh, naturalists have a code of ethics that they operate on. The Texas Master Naturalist has a nice list of the objectives and goals. Uh, like the naturalists, uh, archaeology also has ethics. And I have a list here, I had a list of uh, nine principles. Um, there was a quote I really liked by David Hurst Thomas, who is a, a well-known archaeologist. He's also a curator of anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History. Anthropology, natural history. Humans are part of natural history, part of the natural world. Like naturalists, archaeologists also have a code of ethics, like I said. He stated, we are expected to work toward understanding and preserving and managing sites. Now, one of those things that should be noted as an archaeologist as importance is stewardship. You see here a group of high school students that we worked with in Reserve, New Mexico. Uh, we had a site that uh, we needed some help with, and we also wanted to uh, take that opportunity to let the students participate in that. Uh, I've, as a teacher, I've learned it's more effective to demonstrate and practice stewardship in the field than it is to talk about it in the classroom. And that holds for just about anything you want to teach a student. If you can get them actually doing it, you're so much better. And oh, don't get me started on education. Because <laughs> because one of the things I did with the students I worked with is I took them out and we did things. And I got a teacher's award for it. So anyway, I, I, I know it works. I saw the results. Another thing that should be addressed here is accountability. Archaeologists are committed to consulting with cultures or groups that might be affected by their work. And so they make themselves accountable to the communities where they work, and they work to establish good relationships. 
Colleen was a district archaeologist, and she frequently worked with Native American tribal members. And the tribal liaisons always liked working for Co with Colleen and would even ask for her to participate on their projects. Um, they knew her heart and that she would hold the agency accountable for its actions. Uh, throughout our nation's history, um, you know, this, I want to, uh, <laughs> where are we at now? <laughs> it sure didn't, did it? Okay, I'll tap dance a little bit here. I guess. I'm, okay, well, let's move on. Commercialization. Um, I had a photograph of a table at an artifact show in a nearby town, and uh, I was amazed at uh, what I was seeing there. I don't know why, but there was a, a, just the, the whole tabletop was artifacts that had been taken from a site. Um, it was done for personal satisfaction and for profit. And when those two things are in the, in the mix, it results in the destruction of arc sites and the information that they hold. Uh, artifacts are best curated in public institutions where they can be available for research and education. Uh, where are we at now? Oh. Public education. <laughs> We got public education and outreach. I've had a shot up there of some uh, Texas elementary students at Garner State Park that we worked with. And one of the things archaeologists are to do is to educate the public and to encourage them to protect arc sites. Uh, there are uh, texts and uh, curriculum that do that, like Project Archaeology. Uh, one of the things that I did as an archaeologist was I developed discovery trunks that could be taken into classrooms and uh, before the students and explain to them what archaeology was about. Um, that's one of the things that archaeologists do. Now, there's some other lists there, but uh, we won't go into that. I, I, I take it some of you have seen this poster. It, uh, where's the camera? <laughs> okay, there's the camera. All right. I know, I, I'm about to tell you, okay? The poster says they are stealing Texas history from you. And it talks about looters stealing artifacts and destroying sites. And uh, when that happens, we lose important clues about Texas heritage forever. Well, a code of ethics, uh, unfortunately, doesn't exist among a lot of artifact collectors. Uh, Texas has an abundance of them who basically strip mine the remaining archaeological sites of their cultural resources. I found out that for $25, I can sift through a tractor scoop of dirt that's fresh from the ark site. And I can go through that and hope that I'll find something. Some charge $250 uh, for seven hours of work. You can go there, work seven hours if you pay them $250. It's a, it's a money-making deal for some people. Now, we all know that that destruction of a region's past is legal on private property. And the legal does not always equal ethical, and it sure does nothing to increase our knowledge about archaeology. Our society has become more and more aware that the natural resources of our planet are rapidly being uh, polluted and depleted. And most people, however, do not consider the fact that cultural resources, the artifacts, the features, the structures which still exist on archaeological sites should also be carefully managed. Once the cultural resources on an arc site are displaced, uh, maybe they're shattered by shovels, crushed by heavy equipment, uh, removed to a distant location by the collector, the information, the artifacts contained is diminished, possibly lost forever uh, in somebody's sock drawer. Now, in order to moderate this in some way, our nation developed a series of acts and laws. And by the way, you'll find all the, most of the information I'm delivering here in the Master Naturalist chapter on archaeology. But I want to talk a little bit here about acts and laws protecting cultural resources. By the, late, by the end of the 1800s, our nation's leaders were beginning 
uh, to pass laws to slow the rapid deterioration and destruction of our natural and cultural resources. The first such legislation was the Antiquities Act of 1906. The purpose of that act was for the preservation of archaeological, historic, and scientific sites and their objects on public lands. Okay, keep going. All right, so anyway, this act was uh, put into action by Theodore Roosevelt, and it was him that secured uh, 15 national monuments, starting with Devil's Tower. Uh, he did that during his administration. Another act of protection is the National Historical Protection Act of 1966, uh, Section 106. That act requires federal agencies to consult with state and local governments to avoid and minimize and mitigate negative impacts on cultural and historic resources. Section 106 says a legitimate effort to identify resources that might be eligible for the national record of historic places. Well, look at there. All right. We'll get to you in a minute. All right. Yeah, this artist can see it, but not this artist can see it. Give me a second. All right. I'm on NHPA. Um, it's uh, section 106. Up, up. Now down, no. go down, 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 there's there, I think. Oh, you want to see the kids? <laughs> well, all right, go back to the kids. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Those are the students that uh, we talked to at Garner State Park. Uh, that was part of our effort to educate uh, the public. Uh, then we mentioned... Uh, Theodore Roosevelt and John Muir, the Antiquities Act of 1906. And um, like I said, Theodore Roosevelt was responsible for at least 15 national monuments during his administration. Then we entered into the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106. Uh, that is this, the, uh, the act that Colleen and I worked with the most. Um, I could tell stories about Section 106 and the things we found that it, where the ARC sites had been violated. Um, maybe you know a few yourself. Um, but we found cases where um, artifacts during surveys by cultural resource management crews have been deliberately missed. Uh, anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the sites in an area had been skipped over. Um, that you could speculate on the reasons for that. I won't, but um, <clears throat> they left out the documentation. I suppose the bottom line with CRM in, in many cases is just profit. Another uh, act is uh, ARPA. This act states that collecting artifacts or excavating archaeological sites. The next one down is ARPA there. Uh, can we get to that? All right, there we go. Yeah. Collecting artifacts or excavating archaeological sites on federal or state land without a permit is illegal. You see there, it's, we, we see this a lot whenever we're out doing survey work. It's, it's, we call them a looter's pile. People gather stuff and then they'll go through it uh, with the intent of finding the potteries that uh, have been painted. They really like pottery that's painted. And then they'll, you know, all the other stuff, they'll, they'll kind of leave that behind. So we know, well, people have been here picking over the site, taking home whatever they, they liked it on that day. Um, Colleen and I have been directly involved in an ARPA investigation when we were working in Yellowstone. Um, there was some, we were working on a, a paleo site on the south shore of Yellowstone Lake. And we saw some people coming through the, uh, that day, walking down the lake shore, and we didn't think anything about it. It's park. And then later in the day, when it's getting close to time to leave, we see this same group coming back. And Colleen, Hawkeye here, she, she noticed that 
the women were adjusting their packs uh, furiously. They were trying to trying to get something hid rather quickly. Um, she also noticed that these people were fairly wealthy because they had all kinds of jewelry on. And uh, anyway, we, we kind of wondered what was going on, and we felt like they were hiding something from us as they were walking back to their car. Now, the professor told me, follow those people. Yeah. <laughs> Is this, do I get a good grade for this or what? I, anyway, I, I started following him and he took the rest of the crew back up the shore to find where those people had been. And sure enough, when they got to a certain location, you could see where they had spent the day digging. There was all kinds of shovel marks in the ground, uh, hand shovels. They wouldn't carry a big shovel. They weren't that dumb. And so they'd been digging around up in there. And so, and I didn't know any of this, but anyway, I was following them. And uh, I noticed that they were going to get away. And so I came out from behind the woods and the trees and I said, Hey, I need some help. Can you guys take me to a ranger station? <laughs> and so. They were kind of looking at me funny. I said, yeah, the, uh, the gate where our truck was parked back up in there got locked and uh, we can't get out. We need to go to a ranger station and get some help. So I got, I was watching them while they were putting stuff away and I got out my notepad, wrote down their license plate number and then uh, got in the car with them and uh, they took me to the ranger station. Well, anyway, this thing turned into a big ARPA case and, um, Be a yeah <clears throat> yeah it was it was a it was really a, an interesting deal but that's right there in yellowstone national park and you've got to have some nerve to try and pull something off like that and, and but that's why these laws exist because that's the kind of thing that happens out there in, in the landscape um you, I just read about a case the other day up in Amarillo. Has anybody seen the case that were there uh, on on the river up there? Uh, I think it's Canadian, and they they were at an Antelope Creek phase site, and the geniuses had actually posted hundreds of pieces of their efforts on social media. <laughs> they also posted on the social media a sign warning the public about artifact theft and typed a message that said government shutdown time to dig well it's a good thing a lot of them aren't too bright well anyway the looting mark sites has always been a profitable crime it ranks fourth behind drugs guns and money laundering it is the fourth most lucrative form of crime in 1987, the fine for a first offense could reach $100,000, and the second offense could go up to $200,000. And if you were a corporation involved in that, they could hit you for half a million. All right, NAGPRA. NAGPRA state states that uh, Indian tribes must be consulted when burials are found on public lands. And, and this happened uh, occasionally when I was working on the Grand Staircase. Um, it was quite a process that you go through uh, to contact the, the tribal people, get a hold of the lia liaisons and have them come out. Uh, it also says that museums receiving federal funds must submit inventories of human resources or human remains and burial objects in their collections. Um, now, I've read also that U.S. museums are still holding in storage over 100,000 Native American remains. Um, now, you know, that sounds like the museums aren't doing their job, but you have to maybe peel back another layer and realize that sometimes those remains cannot be, uh, identified as to their, you know, the people that they came from. A lot of times, uh, the historic tribes in that area were, were not anywhere near where that person was buried. They were way up north somewhere. And so it's hard to tell sometimes what tribe to contact. I mean, who are you going to call? The other uh, piece of protection for archaeology is the Antiquities Code of Texas. 
again, it, it also forbids collecting or excavating on property managed by the state, counties, or otherwise. Now, let's go to the next one, all right? Modern field surveys rarely reveal a site like Chaco anymore, at least not in this country. Um, Roosevelt used the Antiquities Act to make Chaco a national monument. How many have been to Chaco? Anybody been to Chaco? Isn't that an amazing place? It, it's just, it just blows you up. I mean, you know, <laughs> you'd have to wander around there for days to comprehend it all. Well, anyway, field survey is one of the things I would like to encourage you guys to really kind of focus in on now. Um, a field survey is, is more than looking for arrowheads. It has exacting procedures that leads to the discovery and the documentation and ultimately the protection of sites on public lands. And you need a survey crew. Now, survey crews come in all shapes and sizes, all kinds of uh, behavior, all kinds of perspectives. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you just kind of have to take what you get. Um, now, that kind of looks like uh, the crew had been drinking heavily the night before and they were in no shape to survey. But actually, uh, crew leaders like Colleen sometimes would have the crew actually get down on their hands and knees and begin to crawl along. We're, I don't think we'd ask that of anybody in here. But sometimes it becomes necessary in some situations. Hey, I know you, and I, and, and I would do it. <laughs> anyway, all right, next one. But the next slide shows how survey usually looks. Again, well, okay. Uh, let's just, yeah. <laughs> There it is. You passed it. There it is. That's what a survey line usually looks like. All right. Now, most of our work as archaeologists re uh, involve field survey. Uh, we actually love the work. We were being paid to travel to some of this nation's most beautiful, remote, and culturally rich regions. I mean, you wake up in the morning and you go, what are we going to find today? And it, it's just every day is kind of an adventure and exciting. I, I wish all of you could spend about four hours or so doing field survey with Colleen and I. We'd really love to. That's, that's something that we love to take people out and do. Um, now, this section of the presentation is going to mention three aspects of field survey. One of them is the technologies that are being used for survey. The other is kind of like pre-survey work that uh, pays attention to topography and the geography. And then there's also cultural evidence. Now, I'm not going to cover the archaeological periods recognized in Texas, nor all of the point styles. I found out the other day that in Texas, there's something like 354 diagnostic types of stone tools. We don't have time to go over all that. Uh, but anyway, there are, you know, all kinds of spear points, knives, atlatl dart points, arrow points, drills, wood shavers, uh, and trying to address even a fifth of that just wouldn't happen. So we feel it's more important that non-archaeologists recognize the clues which indicate an arc site is likely to be in the area where you're walking. Now, as naturalists, you well, back to topography. Um, where are we at, Colleen? Okay, the drones, okay? There's drones. Another piece of technology is ground-penetrating radar. We actually saw this used uh, at a site in Kansas where uh, some African-American miners had been brought in to uh, be strike busters. Uh, they, there was a, a mine, miner strike, and they brought these African Americans in from maybe Oklahoma somewhere, bust them up, and when they got there, uh, it wasn't a warm welcome. Uh, they they killed all of those miners and dumped them in a, in mine pits, and then covered all that over. And so our objective was trying to uh, use ground penetrating radar to find where those graves might be. There's also lidar. Uh, this is something that is way up there and flying over and getting signals uh, sent back that uh, can reveal what's on the ground out there. I mean, this was taken in a jungle area and you couldn't see the ground. The vegetation was so thick. The trees were so tall. But when this 
technology goes over the area, it shows you what's down there on the ground. So you can see the structures, you can see roads, um, all of that becomes visible with the use of LIDAR. There's also metal detectors. Uh, some people like using those. We uh, use those with great effect on, at a Coronado site uh, up in Texas, Floyd Data area. And um, I'd like to have one myself sometimes. And then there's GPS. Um, how many of you use a GPS when you're out roaming around? Anybody? I would, I would like to encourage you to become familiar with this. Uh, it is really a, a wonderful tool. Uh, with this, you can gain a, a high degree of accuracy of where you're at on a map. Uh, I tell people I could drop a quarter on the ground, see where it's at on this thing, come back three years later and find a quarter. I mean, it's, it's an amazing piece of technology. But I am kind of old school, and so I also don't go out the door without my compass and make sure that I've got it on the right declination and also a topo map. Now, I don't, I'm, just, I'm just one of those people that love maps, you know, I, and so I will spend time doing pre-survey research looking at a map, and oh, let me ask you, what would I be looking for on a map if I was about to go out and do some field survey? Water. Water. Absolutely. It'd be water. And these maps will show you where the springs are. It'll show you where the creeks exist. Uh, it'll show you where two creeks intersect, leaving a... a, a, a my supply of water, usually even in the driest times. Uh, another thing you can see on the topo map is where the benches are above a stream. That would be a likely place to look for sites. And what I'm saying here is that having never even been at that location, I can look at that map and I can make some predictions on where I just might find a site. Colleen and I have taught groups how to use GPS technology and maps and compass. And it's always been a lot of fun. Now, this, if you all recognize Inspector Clouseau. He wants to know where he should begin his investigation. Now, as naturalists should, by the way, where are we at on time? Okay, but how long have I been up here? All right, good. I'll, I'll try and wrap this up. All right. So like I said, there's the topography is important to pay attention to. You can look at maps, uh, geologic survey maps, topo maps, general land office maps. Uh, all those things are, are effective. Another thing that I pay attention to are, are uh, eco facts when I'm out walking around. And the eco fact is something that's not made by humans, but often shows up where people have been. Um, why would that flower there have any significance or where do you anybody have an idea where you might find that flower that would be in relation to an arc site it's datura okay that's the name of the flower of the plant that is a hallucinogenic plant and it's it's a it's a serious thing. I mean, it, it, not anybody should mess with it. I would not recommend it. But it was used as a hallucinogenic agent. And so, I would be walking along. We'd be walking along someplace. I go, oh look, there's Datura over there. I wonder if there's a site. And so we'd walk over, and sure enough, a lot of times there would be pictographs and petroglyphs. And I, if you spend any time looking at those things, there's some weird drawings on them. <laughs> that's that's what I, I said. That guy had a really bad trip. <laughs> I mean, their arms are way out here and they're wavy, you know, and, uh, you know, strange heads on them. Uh, so anyway, yeah, if I see the Tura, I know the fun's going to begin. All right. Uh, other species that are kind of indicators uh, is agave. Uh, you see an agave cluster someplace, and sometimes you see them where there's, that's the only one. And so you think, wow, well, something's up here. And so a lot of times when I walk over, I see where they have been processing that plant. Uh, same thing with cactus or uh, sotal. 
Um, they used to put that plant, trim it down, and put that bulb in a, in a roasting pit. Um, and so when I see those plants, I, I begin to really pay attention to what's on the ground around me. You know, there are other eco facts. There's minerals that can be used for making paint, the jewelry, maybe bone. They, you know, sometimes you find fossils. Let's go to the cultural evidence now of human activity. Um, these are the kinds of things that you usually find when you're looking for a site. Is you know, you find a flake scatter somewhere. Uh, you'll find probably all levels: primary, secondary, tertiary flakes. Another thing that I look for when I'm out, well, also you might find some tools uh, along with the lithic scatter, uh, and archaic tools. Uh, let's move on down. Sometimes uh, we'll find a uh, shell that has been fashioned into some kind of a jewelry, some kind of a necklace. Um, but then there's also pottery. Pottery is something that's fairly easy to spot. But and when you see pottery around, it's, it's a good indicator that you, you're probably close to a site. Um, other things that are uh, notable is maybe ground stone. Uh, a rock doesn't get like that usually in nature. They have a slick surface a lot of times. A lot of times that rock is shaped in such a way that it fits the hand perfectly. And so you begin to think, oh, something was going on here. And let's just slow down and take a real good look. There is uh, sometimes, you, you know, that's obvious. Oh, look, there's a site. <laughs> so, uh, Southwest, you do see that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there can be several courses of stone. Uh, most of the time, it's really down to one course of stone right at ground level. But sometimes you find something that's, you know, still assembled that well. Another thing that I look for when I'm out walking around are burnt rock middens. You know, you, you walk around and you, you see something like that and you go, huh, must have been a forest fire here. You know, it's all this burnt rock, but why is this rock all piled up? Well, the reason why is the next slide. It was a roasting pit probably at one time. And so that pile of rocks is your clue that there's something here. Well, habitation sites, that's another thing that uh, we look for. Now, that's Kincaid Rock Shelter. Anybody been there? I, I would love to. You've been to Kincaid Rock Shelter. Well, uh, I'll get with you later. <laughs> I probably is. Yeah, I, yeah. It's With a C. Well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that was a wonderful site. I mean, that thing went clear back to, to, to the Pleistocene as they dug down through the layers. They were finding prehistoric horses, um, some other prehistoric kinds of animals. Then uh, when they got to the, the human layer, uh, they found rock that had been laid right there in the cave. There was kind of a wet area, and it looked like somebody wanted to kind of get up out of that. And so they laid the rock down. And you could tell that's exactly what happened. And that's way down there in the level. Um, but it, this, this cave has evidence of, of human use clear up into historic times. It's a very interesting site. So caves are a great place to look. Um, or rock shelters. There's also agricultural locations. Um, in the Southwest where we worked, we were always looking for some kind of irrigation, uh, or, or maybe some check dams that, that was also a good indicator that somebody had been there and had done some farming. You can see that little swale that goes right up through the center of the picture there. And then you see those rocks laid across it. And those rocks were designed to catch the topsoil and to slow down the flow of the water. And then they could plant their crops in there and successfully farm. There's also ceremonial sites. Uh, have anybody here been to Paint Rock, just north of here in, in Texas, Paint Rock, Texas? That's a wonderful place, too. I mean, it's what, something like 1,500 uh, pictographs and, and petroglyphs on there. And that, they say, it represents a, a solstice mark. And there are solstice marks 
uh, on that cave or on that rock ledge or the, the wall. The thing runs about a quarter of a mile, and it's it's got all kinds of things for a person to look at. The other thing that uh, sometimes people find while they're out walking around, and somebody talked to me about it today, it was kill sites uh, up at Cap Rock. Uh, there's one going on right now where they're excavating. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's, you know, a buffalo jump. Sometimes it's a mammoth kill. But those are kinds of places that you can look. I want to, in conclusion, say, you know, just mention this. What If I find an artifact while I'm out there walking around, uh, what should I do? Well, first thing I do is look around the immediate area. You might be near a site if you're finding an artifact of some kind. And the temptation at this point is to pick up the artifact, to photograph it. And I don't think that is a great idea. But if you take, if you just got to take a picture, you can take the picture, but put it back in its original location. Uh, and if it's in a pathway or if it's easily seen uh, where people walk, um, we tend to cover it in some way. And... Uh, because somebody else is going to spot it and walk off with it, and we want it to stay where it is. So put it as near to the original location as possible if you do feel like it needs to be slightly relocated. <laughs> Don't take the artifact. Um, and you can also record its location, photograph the location. You can mark it on a map, but, and uh, you can contact an archaeologist, but don't post it on social media. Okay. Hey, look what we found today. Uh, you, you don't want to do that. Uh, and if the artifact is on private property, it'll generally, uh, I would generally, um, I would let the landowner know and uh, that I left it out there. And if he wanted to check me on it, I'd take him right back to it and say, see, it's still here. Um, you know, landowners, some of them are very interested in what's on their land. And uh, they really don't appreciate people walking off of things. Well, anyway, that's the conclusion of our presentation. Inspector Clouseau says good luck out there looking for sites. And uh, we uh, have appreciated our time here with you this evening. And uh, I really hope that uh, as you're out doing your field work as naturalists, you begin to kind of pay attention to what's on the ground around you and maybe use some of those naturalist skills you have to um, help archaeologists out in their work. So we have a question from the Zoom audience. Um, I see a viable path for a privately owned artifact collection archaeological site that is shared with the public. Would you call all such collections theft or destruction? Uh, no, not necessarily theft. Uh, because uh, if you have the landowner's permission, then that's between you and the landowner. Now, if you're doing that on public lands, you've got a problem. That's why I mentioned some of these acts that have been passed to protect the cultural resources. And so, <clears throat> no, if, if, if you have cleared it with the landowner, then it wouldn't be theft. If you just pick it up and he doesn't know about it, he might consider it theft. A lot of them are very, you know, jealous that there are, you know, everything stays on their property. So I hope that answers the question. Is that okay? Well, we'll see. <laughs> All right. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Well, you know, yeah. That, well, hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could come up and look at some of the artifacts. Now, by the way, I will say that uh, these artifacts here had been taken out of situ. They're, they were uh, university collections, of, uh, and they had just left that box out and, and said, we're just going to throw it away. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I said, well, look, I, you know, I, I could use some of these artifacts for, for teaching. I mean, that's, those are educational tools. And so, you know, why do that? And so, yeah, I've, we've got some artifacts here that have um, things we, no, we did not pick these up and bring them off of the site. Uh, these were university throwaways is what this was. When I was in 
Oh, oh there we sorry. go. Yeah, that's it. When I was in California, someone brought cases, probably, I don't even know, six feet long by four feet wide, full of, and maybe to my knees. And there were like 12 of them filled with artifacts. And they said, we don't know what to do with these. We don't want them anymore. What you take them. And we're like, sorry, they don't do us any good. But we did take them and they're housing them in California. So, but not in location. So we get a lot of things to, brought in to us. I even, when I was working on the Gila um, in New Mexico, uh, people would go into the caves and they would find corn and they'd be up high in the caves and they would bring me down a corn cob and they said, we found this up in the caves and it was on an archaeological site. And they said, we just wanted to turn it in. And the next day I had to climb all the way back up in the mountains and go put that corn piece back in place. She really wanted out of the office anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, we do spend a lot of time dealing with yeah. this sort of thing. Yeah, artifacts that have found their way where they shouldn't be. <laughs> Any other questions? To let you know, we do have artifacts up here. These, I mean, this. We did not find them here. They were because we like people to know that... I'm oh, sorry, for you. We we like people to know that we aren't. We get invited to private properties a lot, and they want to show us what they found. We want people to know we will not take artifacts. So, for things like this, we have professionals make, and we use them for examples, and let kids or adults hold them and you know see what they really really look like. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, so we have the eye question made. Yeah. My question is, uh, mentioned that you had those professionally made, uh, so what kind of tools do you use to make them? Well, some of them are purists and they'll only use antler uh, to for the uh, actual percussion. And then they'll take the tip of an of a antler prong like this, and then they'll pressure flake the... Uh, secondary and tertiary material off of the off of the stone but there's uh, also those who use copper tools they've got what's called a copper bopper and so you take your stone that's still got the cortex on the outside and you take your little copper bopper and and you hit the outside of the stone and it'll knock off that cortex that'll get you down to the the, the material that you actually want to make the tool out of and so then you have different sizes of copper boppers uh, for the impact. And then, the, and then they also take copper wire and sharpen it. And they put one of it, one end of it into a wooden handle. And then they can use that like a deer antler for pressure flake. So yeah, they, the, the, they can, you know, they can make tools using that. Does anyone hear flint nap at all? You do, do okay. Some of it. What, what do you use? Uh, All right, we got our uh, archaeologist here that says he uses an antler tine and the end of an antler as a billet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this, there's different ways to, to do it. Yes. Archaeology.org. If you keep up with archaeology.hcarchaeology.org, you can keep up to date with some of our activities that would involve demonstrations of flint napping inter alia. In my world history class, I used to take in samples like this, and sometimes I'd have something made out of obsidian. And obsidian, it it breaks on a molecular plane, which means it is sharper than surgical steel. And I would uh, sometimes, I, when I was a neophyte, I would pass around an obsidian tool. And I'd say, hey, kids, isn't this neat? This is made out of obsidian. And I'd tell them, 
don't run your finger down the edge of it because it's very sharp. Mr. Parsons, I need a Band-Aid. <laughs> so, I, after that, I really doled it up if I, if I passed it around the room because there was going to be blood. Before laser surgery, they used obsidian for eye surgery. That's how sharp these yeah. blades are. And I've been cut many times. Too. Uh, it, it, it makes such a clean cut that the eye heals faster. Um, the, uh, the surgical steel, when you look at it under a microscope, it looks like a gravel road. But you look at that obsidian flake, uh, it is just clean, just a clean, sharp edge. And there's an ex you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, well, you should be telling about this, not me. <laughs> yes. Even diamonds. Even diamonds wear down faster than you'd like to have them because they're expensive blades. Yeah. Well, anyway, people wonder, well, how did they cut things? Well, that's how they did it. I mean, it, it was superior to any technology that we have so far. But, but you did have to be able to work it. But you haven't, anybody that's been out, you haven't seen much obsidian in Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah, I worked on a forest the, uh, in California where there you'd come up to a site and it, the, everything was obsidian. And it would be thousands and hundreds of thousands of flakes of obsidian everywhere. How do you make that a site? The whole surface <laughs> is covered with obsidian flakes. That's exactly how it was. Uh, It's, it's a, the site we've worked on in, up, up in West Kerr County. There have been a couple of obsidian shards that have been uh, located from M Malad, Idaho. Great items. Well, in that cave we were talking about, the Kincaid, they found some obsidian and they traced it clear down to Mexico, not too far north. Of, of Mexico City. So that was a great trade item. And you find, I mean, they found in Hopewell sites in Ohio obsidian that came from Wyoming. Now that'll make you stop and think. These people, I mean, they, there was some more sophistication there than what we're giving them credit for. And, and don't lose heart because we actually were invited on someone's property, Lee Thomas. And uh, <laughs> she knows uh, someone's property and they wanted us to look around and she found New Mexico. This is not the piece, but it looked like this New Mexico pottery in Texas Hill Country. It is possible. Well, yeah, that the pottery was such a, a favored trade item. And the Native Americans that didn't make that pottery would trade for it. And so it doesn't stretch my imagination that maybe some Comanche or Lapan Apache uh, was in that area and had that pot, got broken. And so, you know, it's, they, they went hundreds of miles in order to obtain trade goods. Oh, she wants to know if, if we go around and look at people's property. Yes. Medina. Yeah, we can give you a card, can't we, if, it, if it's, it's, it's something, something you want to do. And if we did, we it, that's us teaching you. That's, that's what we're doing, teaching you. 